Okay. Um, <clears throat> good evening, uh, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Shift Connect conference uh, and our panel on arts and culture. Uh, my name is Jacob Quinton, one of the students um, in the conference course this year. And on behalf of our class and our professor, Dr. Ren Thomas, I'm pleased to welcome everybody to this event hosted by the School of Planning at Dalhousie University. Uh, we are grateful to be able to live, work, and play on Mi'kma'i, the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, and we thank our Dalhousie elder in residence, Jerry Musqua LeBlanc, for opening our conference uh, with a blessing this year, as she does, has done in the past. Uh, we'd also like to thank our um, <clears throat> sponsors, the Atlantic Planners Institute, the Licensed Professional Planners Association of Nova Scotia, Turner Drake and uh, Partners Limited, FBM, Fathom, Zap, and the Dalhousie University's President's Office. Um, I'm pleased today to welcome our panel. Uh, we have uh, Bar Barbara Lounder, who um, is an artist and an educator from Nova Scotia. She has a BFA from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, and an MFA from, the college, or from Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. Uh, she recently retired uh, from her position as a professor at NASCAD. Uh, Lounder's art practice <clears throat> uh, uses walking as a creative method. Uh, her situated works engage the public in carefully designed walking activities, sometimes utilizing devices such as walking sticks, stilts, backpacks, portable digital projectors, and mobile phones. Uh, she's a founding member of the Narratives in Space and Time Society, a collaborative uh, interdisciplinary group that uses walking and locative media in, uh, create, in creative public art projects. In 2017, uh, uh, Narratives in Space uh, and Time Society, or Space Plus Time Society, concluded their uh, multi year project, Walking the Debris Field of the Halifax Explosion. In addition to her studio pr uh, practice, Lounder writes and speaks on topics related to contemporary art, walking, and other aspects of mobility, social activism, and education. We also have uh, Shannon Parker with us today, who um, <clears throat> was raised in Annapolis Valley, Nova Scotia, uh, and returned to Nova Scotia in 2006 to join the staff at the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia, and has managed the collections uh, department since that time. Um, she has uh, a degree in uh, classical studies from Queen's University, a diploma in collections, um, conservation and management um, from Fleming College, an MA in museum studies from the University of, and, and a uh, MA in museum studies from the University of Leicester. Shannon has pursued her, cre her career across North, North America, which has included a stint at the National Museum of, Amer of uh, the American Indian in Washington, DC and almost six years in Santa Fe, New Mexico, managing the uh, outstanding art collection of the Indian Arts Research Center. Um, at the AGNS, Shannon manages or managed the care and uh, handling of all the artwork that is uh, acquired or loaned to the gallery, uh, works with the curatorial team to create the um, facility, to create and facilitate the gallery's very busy ex exhibition program online programming, and works on a variety of cultural projects, including recent Good Earth, the Pots, uh, including the recent Good Earth, the Pots and uh, Passion of Walter Ostrom. Outside of her work, Shannon has uh, thrown herself into the dynamic Halifax community with Abandoned, where, among other activities, she trains and performs with a, a local dance troupe, um, a definite challenge during this past year. Uh, we have also have TJ McGuire, uh, an MCIP and LLP uh, licensed professional planner that works at uh, Develop Nova Scotia as their manager of design. Develop Nova Scotia is a provincial crown corporation working closely with communities and partners to build uh, on our natural assets. At the center of uh, Develop Nova Scotia's work, um, is the role of place in attracting people and the principle of placemaking ensures that planning, development, and management of land and infrastructure is achieved with and for people. TJ is also a part of the organizing team of the Art of City Building Conference, uh, which brings global perspectives in city building and placemaking to the city for inspiring conversations. He's a graduate of Dalhousie's School of Planning and has worked with multi multidisciplinary teams on projects from seating installations to large scale developments and programming of a variety of, of events. 
Um, he believes that if you have a great idea, let's make it happen. Uh, and finally, we have Allison DeBorda, the executive director in PBJ or at PBJ Design. Um, she's a recent graduate of the Bachelor of Community Design program at Dalhousie University, uh, where she studied how to evaluate the impact of community projects. Allison is passionate about using creative ways to foster deeper connections and engagement in a community. Uh, and before we start the session, just a few details. We're using the Zoom webinar software, which only allows presenters to speak. So if you have any questions uh, at any time throughout the presentation, you can uh, use the Q&A icon in the bottom right of your screen. Uh, and when the question period, start, period starts, I uh, will um, refer those questions to the presenters uh, as the moderator. Um, and with that, I will start our panel. Uh, first, I'd like to invite uh, Barbara Lounder to present. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, so um, I am indeed grateful every day to be living and working here in Mi'kma'ki. Um, and thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting me and for putting on such a great event. I've had that opportunity to sit in uh, with a couple of the panels and it's been really great. So congratulations. Um, the pandemic has caused, uh, of course, loss of life and physical and mental illness, financial hardship, though in some cases like Zoom, it's caused, I think, a boom. Um, there's been a loss of education and other learning opportunities. It's also increased the urgency of very serious underlying problems in our communities and societies inequities, uh, racism, harassment, environmental crises are seen in every sector, and that includes art and culture. So we're not immune. Um, I'm going to um, share my screen now and show you some images. Great, can you see my title screen now? Okay, great. Um, so my field as a visual artist is concerned with walking and other forms of mobility and how that can be used as a method for creativity, for research and for form making or art making itself. So how an, uh, a walk can be in a work of art. And I want to briefly show you here just a very small selection of some online works that have been done by artists in different places around the world this year. And these have all been created in the, in the context of the pandemic that we're all sharing. Uh, just trying to get to the next slide. There we go, okay. Um, so this first image is of a uh, part of a work by a French artist who goes by the initials JR. And he's known as a street art artist, although his work uh, is in many museums and galleries now and has attracted a lot of international attention. It's called Homily to Country. And uh, it was done about a year ago in an area uh, near the Darling River, the Baca area of New, New South Wales in Australia. And in this piece, uh, he's created a procession where local uh, farmers and uh, Aboriginal people, including the Baca artist, William Badger Bates, carry uh, huge portraits of themselves in the dry riverbed. So tracing the, uh, the path of the river that no longer flows. And it's a kind of mourning for uh, what's been lost in this traditional river country because of drought, climate change. This piece is presented as a video online and is uh, also shown in the gallery as a large projection. Um, this next piece is um, by a Canadian artist named Linda Duval. It's called Getting to Know You Better. Duval is a media artist and she currently lives on land in Treaty 6 territory outside Saskatoon. And during the pandemic and uh, in isolation, she's been walking alone on the land, documenting every day with uh, her camera and with writing, making observations, especially of other creatures and the signs of their inhabitation on the land. So the project is presented online on social media and it's also presented as printed postcards that are mailed out to her audience. So it's a small audience of people who receive the postcards. 
the image that you're seeing on the uh, left are the front and back of one of the cards. And uh, on the right is an uh, image from the front of one of them. And it shows a visiting American badger, which is an endangered species. I think there are only a few hundred of them in that part of Canada. So for Linda, this act of very quiet observation came with a lot of surprises. This piece um, that you're seeing a still from is by um, a Scottish artist named Jill Russell. And like Linda Duval, she's working in isolation in a pretty remote area. She uh, lives inside Cairngorm National Park in the Scottish Highlands. And she's created a, this online uh, daily walking and photography, writing and GPS mapping project called Walking Covidly, which she describes as a hundred days of spontaneous wanderings in, fill and for in hill and forest, drawing with my boots on the hill. And like Linda Duval, repetition, solitude and observing very subtle changes are a big part of her method. Her work is presented as a book work and also on uh, beautiful online animated map uh, mapping drawings. The image that you're seeing is just one screen grab of a much longer map animation where that red line starts to trace itself over the, uh, the highlands. This uh, next image is from a group called LRM or the Loiterers Resistance Movement. And it's a piece called CCTV Bingo. The Loiterers Resistance Movement is based in Manchester and they use uh, psychogeography. So techniques like the derive um, in a walking project. It's led by human geographer, Dr. Morag Rose. They go out uh, every month and explore and document kind of, I guess, the underside of the city from disability, working class, queer, and, and radical perspectives. And just a reminder that Marx and Engels first uh, met and started to work together in Manchester. So they, they have a great um, background there. Manchester's had over th 300 days of isolation. So often walking together actually means walking alone, but using Twitter, WhatsApp, Zoom, and other synchronous and asynchronous tools. Um, and I'll just read the instruction from the top left there. How to play, go for a walk wherever you fancy. When you have found a good place to start, look around and find a CCTV camera. Follow its gaze, let it guide your wandering until you spot another one, and then head in the direction it points you to until you see another camera showing you the next way to go. Carry on in this manner until you've had enough or you have filled in every square with details of appropriate cameras, including when and where you spied them. Um, this next slide is uh, a still from Zuppa Theatre, from a local um, group you might know of, who work here in Chibuktuk. They've been working outside of theatres, like outside of the brick and theater, uh, mortar theatres for uh, many years. And they also began using apps and locative media uh, quite a while ago. They work collaboratively. Their approaches are very open-ended. Uh, with lockdown, experiencing their work became singular. So individuals uh, could go out on their own and experience their pieces. The works were asynchronous. Uh, audiences could download their free apps and then walk, look, listen, and experience the work on their own. The themes for the last two projects, Vista 20 and Labor 7, were the pandemic itself. Vista, 7, uh, Vista 20, which was produced last year for Mayworks, features first person narratives from seven healthcare workers in HRM, which were recorded in interviews uh, done last April and May. So, very current and topical work. This last set of images are a couple of pieces that I've worked on this year. The one on the left is uh, called Ambulant, and it's a crowdsourced uh, animated piece about eight minutes long. And it was done in lieu of an in-person project that I would have done at an international art festival <clears throat> last summer, which of course I didn't get to go to. The project was about looking for signs, actual physical signs in the city of how our movements are directed and shifted through uh, pandemic requirements. And it's accompanied by a kind of 
uh, subjective narrative about how, how it feels to be in that kind of space. The material was gathered over social media and other internet connections. So there were contributors from Copenhagen to Manchester to here, all over the place. The finished work was shown online and eventually it'll be part of an e-publication. On the right, you're seeing a detail of a slide of a work that's just started in January. It's called Corona Walker. That's re a real name. Um, it's a walking and art project that's based in central Dartmouth and it originates with research into a headstone that I noticed years ago for a young woman named Corona Walker who died in 1889. So this is very small group gatherings and walks, uh, performances, if you will, and uh, writing. And this is all being done, you know, in real life, in real locations, but uh, shared through social media. And this last slide here just gives you some links if you wanted to uh, look up more of the artists uh, afterwards. And I'll just conclude with a couple of remarks, obser my observations. Um, first of all, obviously walking itself has gained a lot of importance and recognition through the pandemic. Um, walking artists have often worked with themes of community and connection and paying attention to things like the use of public space, other creatures, other people, relationships. They use approaches that are usually exploratory and experiential, multi-sensory. They stress process as opposed to predetermined results. Their projects are often collaborative and engaged with community. They take place outside of institutions and usually marketplaces of art. And there's a kind of blurring or softening of the line between art and life in a lot of walking art. Um, in terms of tools, I see a lot of ingenuity and adaptability with readily available and accessible tools and methods and platforms from social media apps to locative technologies, both in the creation of the work and the sharing of it. I think these trends have been developing in this little field of walking art for a long time, and I think they'll continue to develop and uh, flourish in, uh, in the near future. So thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Um, so next up, uh, we have Shay. Thank you so much. So I'm going to look at this from a more institutional perspective um, and the, how the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia shifted over the course of the pandemic to still deliver what we considered some of our core functions, uh, even though nobody could actually visit the gallery. And so aside from visiting the gallery and seeing exhibitions, normal activities for us would be to public programming with um, school groups, uh, with uh, many different specialty groups. And with a lot of support, we were able to shift a lot of that online. So I'm gonna show you a couple of examples how we did that. We also, uh, as an entire team, started looking at our collection and using social media a great more to emphasize it. And a lot of our visitor services staff uh, got to do a lot more writing and we all got very uh, interested in doing uh, and wrangled into doing video and other elements that we really hadn't explored before. Uh, it wasn't completely easy. Um, we uh, have only one graphics design person on the team, so she was completely overwhelmed by all of this um, and it was an exhausting period. So it you think it was going to be a quieter period of time and it really wasn't, um, but I'm gonna show you some of our um, things that we've done. So, um, one of the big shifts we made was to uh, work with a company to create virtual exhibitions. Um, so that you can take any exhibition and they would film it and allow you to walk through it. Now, this is an exhibition, Good Earth, that we just closed uh, this Monday, actually. But at any point, you can go in and zoom around, look at all the detail for each of the objects, learn about each of the things. And we've done this for a number of our different gallery spaces. Um, 
which is great. It gives you a real ability to see and be in a space. It still wasn't quite as good as getting to go and visit it in real life. Um, but for us, one of the big ones is, of course, without um, people being able to come and visit Nova Scotia, a lot of the audience that we normally deal with um, weren't able to come. And in this exhibition in particular, uh, Walter was a huge uh, mentor and teacher for a lot of students. And the original plan was to have a big old party celebrating his retrospective. And we just, of course, weren't able to do that. If you go to our website, our virtual tours, uh, you can see the Maude Lewis gallery and uh, you see video clips and other bits that have also been added to the gallery spaces. So um, uh, you can have a pretty rich experience without actually physically being there, which was really exciting. We were able to do this uh, in part because our uh, one of our sponsors, BMO, uh, who provides our free access uh, on Thursdays, um, said, yes, you can absolutely use some of our funding and find another way for people to have free access to the gallery, which is pretty amazing, actually. One of the other things that we've done um, is we've done a lot of studio at home things and in kind of the same. Hi and welcome to Studio from Home with the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. My name is Becca and today we will be learning about and experimenting with surface decoration by taking inspiration from the work of ceramicist Walter Ostrom. For step-by-step -step instructions for this and many other activities, please visit the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia's website. We would love to see what you've made, so please I'm also dealing with a new computer today, so it's being very fun. Um, <laughs> however, um, we have a huge catalog now of working from home, uh, fun art activities with all sorts of different um, things to explore. We've worked with different artists to create these, as well as some of our visitor services staff, um, some of the curators, uh, just about everybody has contributed something to this. So there's this wonderful, wonderful catalog now of ways to connect to art at home without having um, a huge amount of materials necessary. And one of the things we're even doing now, because of course, we still don't have our usual March break activities, uh, is this year, because it wasn't such a, such a surprise for everybody, uh, we created some special events, um, including some art kits that people can come to the gallery and purchase and then uh, ex explore either um, doing some rug hooking, kind of using yarn with our Deanne Fitzpatrick exhibition, or building materials with 3D dimensionals uh, in relationship to our Making Space exhibition. So these are many, a couple of the examples of the things that we're doing with the art gallery and have done and continue to explore. And I think the big one for the gallery, of course, is that finding new ways to reach out to people and reach people beyond who we usually talk to. And it's been really lovely actually in that uh, it's been a way to connect with people. We've done different artists talks and uh, discussions which have been really wonderful, uh, much like this that we then record and put on our YouTube uh, channel for everybody to see later. So it's been wonderful and stressful <laughs> uh, in a lot of uh, ways, in so many ways. Um, because on top of doing this, we also were allowed to reopen and so have been open aside from that short period in November where we were shut down again. Um, we were open and operating, but we were operating on a much reduced schedule. So you had a balance of us doing both online and in-person things. So it is a small team and it's it stretched a lot of us. So um, I think that's that's important. So 
we really like the options we've come up with. These art kits actually are really exciting for us because it's a nice in and out kind of option. We love the studio at home, um, but it also highlighted for us how a lot of the people that we normally connect with don't necessarily have great internet connections or technology and really highlighted some of the areas that we want to um, and the, the communities that we want to make sure we reach and connect with. So it, we partnered with Wonderneath um, during the summer when we had to cancel our summer programs and created art kits um, that were given out to, um, to people for them to work with. Um, but it's, our programming team have been amazing. They've turned on a dime <laughs> and they've come up with some great solutions. I don't think these are all of the possible solutions. I've seen some amazing ones out there, but I'm also really proud of the gallery from this province of being able to turn so quickly on a dime that a lot of other galleries um, weren't able to. And of course, we were very fortunate being a provincial gallery to have that continual support. And a lot of other galleries really did not. And so they've suffered a lot more during this, uh, whereas we were able to keep running. So the exciting part about this though, was um, also how we made sure that we were continually supporting the artists themselves, because while we're using much more in social media and on video and all of that, uh, you also make sure that the artists or the are uh, who own the copyright and intellectual property rights um, get paid for their participation and allowing us to use those images. So that's something that we continue to work with as well, because that's a very important thing is, as an institution is showing the art, but also supporting the artists in a more substantial way as well. So. Um, I think that's all I have to say at the moment, but I look forward to chatting with you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that was very awesome. Uh, up next, we have uh, TJ McGuire of Nova Scotia. Okay. Still don't get used to this stuff. Okay, can everybody hear me? Okay, perfect. My computer may crash in the middle of the <laughs> technology. Okay, uh, listen, thank you for the invitation. Like I, I'm really loving the discussion so far, um, making lots of connections all, already within Shannon and Barbara's uh, work. Um, I, I'd like to speak today about, you know, the idea of connecting people and places, um, or I, as I like to call it, the art of placemaking in 2021. Um, I work with Develop Nova Scotia. We are a provincial crown corporation um, who works on places and, and helps the province invest in places. Uh, but we, we do this with, or we, we try to do this with people and communities uh, and also for people, uh, sort of the inclusive and uh, universal design approaches. Um, so, so. Some of you may know us as a waterfront development. Uh, that's that's where I uh, started my job, and we we changed our name to Develop Nova Scotia. But uh, the, we we sort of steward the Halifax waterfront, uh, the the public space all on the boardwalk, um, and from programming to sort of what what projects happen there, from the the mixed use developments, uh, yeah, to the events. So it's a and and the daily maintenance and management. Uh, there's it's a small team, but uh, but we we managed to do a lot, and now we've had, we have a mandate to work across Nova Scotia. So this is how we used to gather before COVID. I don't know if that makes anybody feel uneasy. Um, uh, and this is this is what our engagements used to look like. We used to bring people down to the waterfront. We used to invite them. Uh, put ads in the papers, go online and say, come down and let's let's chat about how this space could be different. Uh, this is this is a parking lot sort of between the wave and Bishop Landing, if you know the waterfront. Uh, and we were trying to figure out how to relocate some of our small vendors and create a new space with them. Um, and I just want to like point out um, like a question right now, like who's who's not in this photo? Um, we were we were trying to do, you know, the, the right thing at the time, and and uh, recognizing, you know, in hindsight, there's there's a lot of barriers for people to, you know, come down and be invited to 
even a simple activity like a place game. Um, that being said, it was short, like nine months, we managed to transform a parking lot into a place uh, that people wanted to come, thanks, thanks to that public input and iteration on the concepts. Um, it, it's become a place where we were hosting a lot of events. Um, and yeah, so it, it's, it's a really popular spot. But then, you know, the pandemic happened. And uh, I don't know if, what changed on your end, but I, I was, you know, living the downtown life and, and now I'm a chicken farmer. And uh, I'd like you to meet uh, Chikira, Chip, Princess Leia, Nugget, and Margaret Hatcher, um, all chickens. So, yeah. So, and how we communicate has changed. Uh, everybody knows about Zoom and Teams and all those other platforms. Uh, some of it is cumbersome and we're still getting used to it. Uh, but there's other parts that are really exciting. Like uh, I've been involved in some workshops where you're collaborating with people from all over the world and, and in breakout rooms where you're like having intimate conversations with people you would never ever normally meet. Uh, so there's something really exciting about that. Uh, and our, our places are changing. Like we've, we've had to adapt our streets and places uh, to this new reality. And I, I think it's really leapfrogged what our desires and aspirations were around public spaces. Uh, this is an example from Halifax. Uh, thank you, Emily, for letting me use your photo. Uh, here's an example from St. John's, Newfoundland. So like completely transforming what the main street looks like and experiences. And we, we, we tried to pilot some things on the waterfront, uh, even, even with all the guidelines and restrictions, we managed to uh, have an, host an evergreen festival. Uh, a lot of it was sort of canceled last minute due to restrictions, but we managed to have a lot of lighting installations happen. And it, it was amazing the draw that that, that had and, and the social media presence of people sharing uh, photos and, and selfies and, and just, just sharing these moments uh, online. Um, we had plans to have a, you know, 24 stall uh, holiday market uh, with, vent with a variety of vendors. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, but what did happen is we invested in the infrastructure. So now we can think about what these could be used for moving forward. Like maybe there's a spring market or, or these are distributed throughout the city. Uh, really open to any ideas people have um, on how to use these. Uh, and another sort of thing spin-off that happened is the festival wasn't just in person that we we had to do it online as well so there was an online marketplace component uh, so there's this sort of hybrid thing happening where we're doing things in person and online and Shannon spoke to that earlier um, there's also you know communities are banding together and 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 requesting these sort of changes happen uh, this is an example of uh, Hubbard's they're, they're looking to change the, the safety of the, of the road that goes through their community. Uh, and and they're, I looked it up, their population is 400 people and they have 1.3 thousand members on the <laughs> Streetscape project page. So I don't know, a lot of people care about these issues. Um, and, and, I, I, and they're also getting top-down support. Like we, we helped collaborate with the uh, NSFM uh, Main Streets Initiative. Uh, and it's it's really pushing the envelope on what these main streets can be. Um, and at another level, the, the federal government's got the Healthy Communities Initiative. Uh, there's still another round of grants to go, and and they're they're really investing in making these these places healthier and more responsive to to our current challenges. And another exciting example is is the Everyone Every Day uh, Shibukta program through the Mi'kmaq Friendship Center and uh, Participatory City. Um, highly recommend checking out Halifax as everyone if you haven't heard of it. Uh, there's a lot of programming uh, intended to connect people with each other uh, from different backgrounds uh, and, and just yeah get make those connections and there's online activities and in-person activities. Uh, so I, I quickly want to unpack this idea that I said in the opening is this with people concept. Um, so it's it's easy. A few of those first examples I shared were sort of for people. It's like the city doing it for a community. 
uh, very top, like top-down approaches to solving problems. Um, and, and one thing we're really trying to figure out and work on is how do we collaboratively and constructively work with each other to make these changes? Because if you get the bottom up and the top down working towards the same things, uh, that's probably unstoppable. So um, it's an inclusive approach. You know, it, it, uh, someone said, uh, I think it was the CTV, CCTV example of go, getting out there and seeking those different perspectives. Uh, is really important. And, and these online tools, uh, it's, it's an opportunity to connect to a lot more people than, than you previously had. Um, and make it, you can make space for new conversations. Uh, it, just, it provides another option. And in some ways, it, it, there's issues with it, but it's also like, you know, for some people, it can improve accessibility. Uh, there's the auto transcription of, of, of what people are saying. That helps. It's not perfect, but um, it's 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 yeah it's a, it's a different option. So I, yeah, I'd like to reiterate the hybrid approach. That I think that's the way things are probably going to move forward. Is you shouldn't be doing things totally online, and but you shouldn't be doing things just in person either. Uh, it's it, and I, I think that's here to stay. Like we we all know how to use Zoom now for the most part, um, and there's so many other tools out there, and, and there's new apps being developed every day, and like those virtual tours. Shannon are amazing. So how like how do we incorporate those into what we're doing? Um, and then that question at the beginning, like yeah, embracing my inner Jay Pitter. Keep asking that question every time you're doing something. Who is not here? Who who whose value am I missing out on by not having a certain conversation? Uh, and and how how can we help them achieve what they're trying to achieve? Um, something that just it's a bit of an urban design principle catering to the senses. We're all humans, um, I think. And, uh, and it's just this online world, it's, it can be great, but be mindful that you're only really catering to two senses, uh, the, the hearing and the vision. Um, and, but you, know, it, you can still have authentic connections just through a phone call. So, so but just something to be mindful of. And, uh, and in closing, I just want to share three transformative projects that are sort of underway and happening that, I, that I'd love everybody to know about and maybe participate in. Uh, the first one is Peggy's Cove. Um, we've over the co over the COVID period, we did a lot of intensive workshops with the community, one-on-one um, -on -one sessions, uh, like site walks, community meetings. Uh, distanced and, and work with the community to develop a sort of a community vision. And there's things like they're, they're on site right now making the changes happen. Um, and, but what we found out is that, you know, people outside Peggy's Cove also really care about this place. So it's easy to focus on the immediate uh, audience, but how you also need to pull back and think about who else cares about it. And, you know, as, as much as we want Peggy's Cove to be what it exactly is today, we have to recognize that it doesn't work well for everybody. And, and these, some of these changes need to happen to make it inviting and welcoming to everyone. Um, another exciting project is the Canard redevelopment. Uh, we heard uh, seven years ago uh, from the public that they really wanted a place to play in, on the waterfront. Um, and now with, with the current uh, conversations and, and issues, like we're, we're combining that with inclusive inclusivity and having those hard and challenging discussions around how can we make the waterfront playful and more inviting for people that may not feel welcome. Um, so it's a really exciting project. We're, we're gonna be going public fairly soon with, uh, with opportunities to engage in, around this conversation. Um, so it, yeah, how do we work with people to make this more inviting? And lastly, uh, I know everybody's seen, I know Shannon's seen the renderings for the arts district. This is an incredibly exciting project and, and there's like flashy images out there like this one, like really beautiful. Um, but I just wanna say like, do not look at that as the final product. It's all we've done so far is select a team and and there's going to be a whole process around getting involved and and reimagining this uh, you know enormous space on the waterfront and and how that can be more welcoming for everyone as well. So I just want to say thank you and 
Uh, the chicken, oh, sorry. <laughs> and the chicken say thank you too. And that's Princess Leia in the middle too. So when you name them early on, you don't know. Anyway, thank you. Thanks, TJ. Um, all right, and uh, now we, I'll pass it over to Allison to present, and then we'll wrap up with a quick Q and A session. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I got on my first page. All right. So hi, everyone. I'm Allison. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, public art and uh, how that sort of evolved and changed um, during COVID-19 uh, for us. So I'm uh, from PBJ Design. We're a nonprofit that does public art and placemaking across Nova Scotia. Um, and so we started uh, back in 2015 um, doing the Play Me Halifax piano. So um, we started this project as a way to connect people to public spaces and to their communities. Um, and it kind of took off from there. And so we did the public pianos for a number of years uh, and then started to play around with some, some different concepts and different placemaking ideas. Um, and uh, since then, we've kind of been growing and exploring some, some different things. So uh, naturally, <laughs> as everyone knows, uh, that shifted a lot when COVID hit. Um, so originally, our, our vision for public art was something that uh, was really interactive and had a sense of play. Um, we always wanted the projects that we did to have an element of interaction with it. So um, like with a piano, uh, it, the piano itself usually looks nice, but the, the part of it that really activates the space is when you hear the music and when you're, when you're playing the piano itself. But um, of course, it's challenging to, to do that these days, <laughs> uh, to you know, touch something in spaces or, or have contact with things that the public is also in contact with. Um, so that definitely changed the way that we come up with ideas um, and the process that we take to try and test out new ways of doing placemaking in, in public space. And so um, one example of a way that we adapted was um, we, we tried to come up with projects that were contactless yet still had that interactive component. So um, naturally it's <laughs> quite challenging, but um, we, we made a, a temporary structure that was an archway that was motion sensor. So the idea is when you walk through, um, it, it lights up and, and it sort of creates a space where, you, where you're the one lightening up the, uh, the space and, and beautifying the area that you're in. Um, and, and then recognizing that there's other ways of um, adding that interactive element as well. Um, last summer, we worked with uh, Halifax Pride to uh, do a, a public art project during the Pride Festival. So um, we did a project where um, people could submit messages to their community and we printed them out on postcards and hung them with string lights in Victoria Park. Um, so it was just a way for people to send a nice message to people in their community. Um, and when people walked by, they were able to see, see the messages. It brought a smile to their face, um, but it also just helped remind people that they're not alone. And even though it <laughs> feels like it, it's not the case. Um, or at least that's what we're working towards. So um, that was just an example of how when um, projects like this can help people be a part of creating it, even if they're not an artist. So just trying to think about um, placemaking in public space and how we engage in different spaces and um, how we can involve uh, people from, from all different types of skill. We also did um, a, a bus shelter mural. So we wanted to you know, also recognize that not everything is interactive and <laughs> there's a lot of value in that too. Um, but we were really doing um, this bus shelter meal project as a way to explore um, how art can impact the way that people engage with space. So um, this was a project that we did to try and see if it would reduce um, vandalism and, and make a space feel more welcoming. Um, this bus shelter is at the corner of Spring Garden in Barrington and um, often was vandalized and was dark and not the most welcoming space to be. Um, and just with a, a really basic um, 
or maybe not really basic, but just by adding art to it, uh, it was a way for people to feel a little bit more welcoming in the space and um, it's, it's vandalized a lot less now. Um, and then also just to add that, uh, I think the value of public art right now is that we're also so stressed and, and the way that we engage with space, I think can be really stressful for people. And, um, you know, if, if cases are high, I think a lot of people feel stressed going on transit or um, just being in public in places where um, that sense of safety is gone. And so I think art plays a really important role in um, helping people just feel more comfortable in the everyday things that we have to do, like taking transit. Um, and then COVID has also emphasized the importance of parks and trails. Um, we we all, we all need them. And this last year has especially showed that. Um, so one project that we did to try and um, add the sort of placemaking artistic element to this was a wildlife mural. So um, we created a, a mural with a community chalkboard at a trailhead in um, East Hans. And so the idea is it uh, engages people with what wildlife they might see on the trail and then also how they can help protect it. Um, and the chalkboard was just a way for people to maybe write a message for the next person who's about to go on the trail or tell them what they saw. Um, and we noticed that that chalkboard filled up really quickly, um, which is, is just one of those ways that um, those kind of unique creative ways to connect with people when that's lacking, I think is um, really valuable. And then um, we also realized that it's it's hard to gather in public space right now. It's hard to do um, a lot of things in public space right now. Um, so we thought about the values that that placemaking has in terms of connecting people, helping them feel like they're part of their community and that they appreciate their community. Um, so we created a project called Huga Kits. So we partnered with Veith House in the North End to uh, make 500 kits that were um, designed with the concept of Huga in mind, which is a Danish uh, term that represents feeling of comfort. So um, the project was filled with uh, things that hopefully made people feel more comfortable and more connected. So uh, we had like a, a mix to make a soup. Um, we had a journal, some like hot chocolate and a gift card to a local cafe. Um, and then we also partnered with Engage Nova Scotia on their For Me To You campaign. So we had a few blank cards in there uh, for people to write notes to people in their community. So we really were just encouraging people to to connect with their neighbors and friends and family um, in ways that they might not be able to. And then lastly, just recognizing uh, the challenges that um, all of this, this has. Um, I think uh, there's COVID has um, brought about a lot of opportunity in, in unique ways, but um, of course there's a ton of challenges. Um, and so one of uh, the projects that we've been working on um, is a warming huts project. So um, the goal is that uh, we'll be able to build a warming hut in the town of Kenful with the idea of it um, uh, improving after transportation, but also just providing a space for people to, um, you know, go on the trail, come into the warming hut, warm up, connect with other people in their community, um, and that the inside of the warming hut can um, encourage people to tell stories about the community and learn about more um, in their area as well. So um, I think a, a project like this is, is interesting when we think about arts and COVID because um, it's it's definitely shown the, the challenges that the COVID has brought and also just like the, the need to continuously adapt and change. Um, you know, for us, we were very close to building this when COVID hit um, and, and with with the rise in building costs, for example, we're, we're continue, continuously evolving, changing designs and working through um, those kinds of things. And so um, when we have a project like this, just trying to think about like, how can we create spaces like this where, um, you know, in the future, we might be able to see a vision of where people can connect in, in this area, but um, what does that look like right now? And, and how do we, how do we work towards where we want to be while also recognizing that um, there are a lot of challenges that we face right now. So um, yeah, a lot of pieces to it, but um, just goes to show that there's there's still things to look forward to. And as everyone says, there's the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> so uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for listening. Thanks. Um, I guess, yeah, I'd like to open up the floor to any questions. Um, 
There's actually already one in the question box here for you, Shannon. Uh, I don't know if you see that. Uh, I did, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, would you like to give a take a stab at that? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I love the idea that um, our virtual tours do allow an increased access for people with limitations. I mean, we all know that at the best of times, the art gallery is located downtown and it's hard to get to if you're not in that vicinity, you don't have easy access to transportation. Um, in terms of seeing what other uh, galleries and libraries have noticed, I mean, the libraries have been doing an amazing job uh, as always as, as support networks for our community. Um, one of the really nice ones is particularly with the Ostrom exhibition, which was part of what I was showing you, uh, that was actually part of a, a federally funded project that we were doing through uh, the museum's assistance program. And so our schedule got completely shifted uh, because it was shut down. Um, we were supposed to open May 2020. Uh, so it and then go on to another venue. So of course, the timing got completely shifted. But our partners with the Canadian government were really, really excited to see how, even though, uh, one, how we shifted, um, and so we opened the exhibition in October, extended it through March, it's going off to Canadian Clay and Glass Gallery up in Waterloo, where it will run from May through September, but they were really excited to see how we did the virtual uh, tours as well, and that was something they were really excited to see, and that's, I mean, that's full kudos to one, the team that, uh, the company that does these, like that's, mm -hmm. it's not an option for every gallery. We're fortunate that we were able to take funding intended for other things and use it for that purpose. And that we had a team to then go through and insert all of the details from all of the labels. And there were a lot of them because <laughs> it's a very big exhibition. So um, we were fortunate that way. Uh, and I don't know that everybody has. Um, that opportunity, but I love the idea of the virtual tours. I think I'll be more excited about it when I get to see more things in person and then I can be lazy and go on tours of other places, so. Okay, um, I didn't see any more questions, but I have one here that I've uh, prepared. Um, I think, so I think this will be interesting considering how um, each of you sort of have a, a different perspective on um, art in the public sphere. Um, so what role, uh, and anyone can jump in or build off the other person's point, obviously. Um, what role do you think the, that art will play or can play or should play in any of those in the uh, post-pandemic recovery? Um, I'm, I'm just going to jump in a little bit because we had a really wonderful artist discussion with Lindsay Montgomery, who's an amazing ceramic artist, and she does these beautiful, um, medie using medieval imagery uh, to create um, these visuals on, on her ceramic pieces, and she's just opened a new exhibition called The Year of the Flood, really looking at what it's been like living in during this pandemic, but from a using this medieval imagery and it's really fascinating. So I think part of what artists do is they take an experience and allow us to experience it in very different ways. They unpack it in ways that we get to explore and understand and maybe give us different ideas. But on the alternative side of this, I also have, these are very visual artists and I have friends who are performance artists who haven't been able to practice as a group. Um, this has been a very difficult time for them. And I think, I don't know about the rest of you, but being able to watch a movie or whatever has been vital, um, being able to go out and dance and be around people, it's part of what makes us human. And it's really going to be interesting to see how that recovers. And I don't think it's gonna be immediate because you've lost a lot of people in time and training, so. Okay, um, I guess I'll ask another question. 
Um, yes. Um, what um, <clears throat> What do you think? I, I think you were just sort of hinting at this, um, Shannon. Like, what do you think that the lasting challenges for arts and uh, culture will be after the pandemic? And um, yeah. I guess how is, I think you've all showed this, uh, that like how has the pandemic uh, changed the ways in which art is created and consumed, which is, I think that the, that the second part was definitely answered here today. I'd like to say that I, I think that um, the crisis, the crises that we're facing has really underscored the need to support the arts and to see art and cultural activity as being uh, essential, that um, maybe it's not essential in the same way as uh, healthcare workers and people uh, providing you a grocery checkout and that kind of thing, but in terms of people's well-being and also people's ability to imagine and to uh, see the world from very different perspectives, I, I think it's, uh, it's been really underscored this year that um, the arts has a huge role to play. And um, we definitely need to be lobbying and, and uh, campaigning for really secure and, and robust support uh, over the coming years for the arts. And I think especially in the performing arts who uh, many of those uh, sectors have been just decimated because their venues have been closed. Um, I'll add as well, if you haven't had a chance, there was a really interesting article, I think in the New York Times 75 questions, 75 artists to see basically how they've handled the pandemic. And it's the gamut. Some people were inspired and ridiculously productive and other people haven't been able to touch a thing. Mm -hmm. And I can honestly say as someone who works full time and, and you know does dance, um, I haven't had capacity or the creativity to look at the performative side of things. It has just been focused on work and it's starting to get better. We're starting to see it, but that's been my focus. And I've seen it with a lot of my other friends, whereas others where that's their passion and their focus, they've shifted and done online performances. It's not the same thing though. They definitely feel the drag and the lack of energy because so much of it is that interplay between person and audience um, that really adds an element that you don't otherwise get. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add one thing to just tag on to what you were saying, Shannon, and uh, brings to mind a couple of the um, points that uh, TJ made and also Allison um, about projects that they've been involved in where there's a blurring of the boundary be between public space and private space. And I think that's a really, you know, incredibly powerful thing that we see in the best of art, like this way of making a public institution or a public space feel comfortable and feel like your home and feel like you're welcome there. So I keep visualizing the hammocks on the waterfront. And I know for myself in the summer, I put a hammock up in the backyard and they feel like that saved my sanity. So when we can get lots of hammocks in happening again in public spaces, I think that that will be a really great kind of cultural thing that will be for the collective good. Happy to say that the hammocks are out and I think they were only taken in for a couple of weeks. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, great. Yeah. And they're there all winter, so. Yeah, I've seen lots of uh, Instagram photos of them, yeah. Good to, yeah, good comment on the blurring the boundary that I know uh, David Sims book, Soft City, mm -hmm. is, all, is all about that. How do we sort of soften those edges around, you know, like buildings and, and it's not just the built form, but how do we make it uh, the more inviting and, and welcoming and, and connected and, and so there isn't that hard edge between public space and private space, I guess. Yeah. Do we have time for one more question? I'm going to take it. Um, I have a, que a question for Shannon. Uh, Sorry, about, 
about volunteers and um, docents, like that's a bit that's been a big part of, of the AGNS. Have you been able to continue working with those people? Um, I, and then I can speak to this very eloquently because my mother is one of our docent guides um, and has been bored out of her skull. Um, so we've we've certainly worked with them to some extent. Um, we have their coordinator who's made regular contact with them um, over the course of it so that they'd have meetings. Um, we worked with them a bit in that usually when we're working with our docents and guides, we're teaching them and training them about the upcoming exhibitions and their learning and doing research. Uh, and so this has been a frustrating thing for them is that uh, a lot of them were not interested in learning about an exhibition that wasn't gonna happen for six months and chances are they weren't going to be able to be there to guide. Um, we, prior to the November, December lockdown, were able to do um, it's kind of member events where we were able to post some of our docents and guides so that they could be uh, on the floor and talk to, but it's not the same as guiding a tour and mm -hmm. showing all your favorite highlights. So they're, they're really finding it challenging, I think. And, uh, uh, the, it, and the downside is most of our, our docents and guides are among uh, the older population. So they're also the ones we wanted to make sure we protected the most. Um, fortunately, most of them will get the vaccines before the rest of us. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I think, uh, I know from speaking from my mother's sake, she's very excited to be able to be around and chat to groups of people and discuss art and just have that interaction the, more so than anything. So, um, and it's been hard. We actually just lost one of our, our fabulous uh, docents and guides um, recently, and they weren't able to get together. They did a Zoom funeral. Mm -hmm. And so that was really challenging for them uh, as well. So it's, um, yeah, we, we haven't come to, there was no great epiphany on how to work with our docents and guides. And, um, and there wasn't, there's only so much I think they can tolerate uh, for virtual as well from what we've seen. And that's, that's okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we're all there at some point. So. <laughs> um, I, this is a question for, I guess, TJ, uh, TJ or Allison, and, but I mean, anyone can answer. It. Um, but this, ha I guess, this has to do with your presentations. How have you guys seen the, how public space has been viewed uh, in Melbourne? Maybe over the whole pandemic, but certainly since perhaps uh, when we first got out of uh, isolation for the first time. Um, I can. Allison, do you have anything? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, I think I would just say that uh, I think public space has gone from something that we um, know that we appreciate and um, is something that we we like recognize as like a, a value and a thing that we need. Um, or maybe we didn't realize that as much before, but I think uh, I think now we see it as something that we we see the value in it. But I think a lot of people also um, like naturally have a sense of fear about it. Um, and I mean, I think it depends on the, what spaces, um, what they are, and you know how how busy they are or or what they look like. Um, but I think it will take a while for people to feel comfortable engaging with them again in the ways that they did before. Um, and kind of tying back to the, the question from before, I think it's interesting to, to think about where we are now and like it being a year in, which is so strange to say. Um, and just thinking about like how, how, how long we've been in it and how long we've been, uh, you know, used to the changes and, and, and the effects that it has on people. Um, and then also just thinking about like how that'll 
how that'll affect how long it will take for us to get back to those that space of like feeling comfortable and excited and proud of public spaces. Um, and I think art definitely plays a role in helping us get there again. Um, but I think the path to doing that will be interesting because there's a lot of pieces at play um, when we're considering like comfort and safety and um, you know the impact that mental health has has played on um, how people feel in public spaces. So I think there's a lot of layers to it and um, it's, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really have a solid answer, but I don't know if anyone does at this point. <laughs> yeah, it's been, yeah, it's sort of flown by, but we've been through so much, like there's been so many, I don't know, everybody's had a different experience, but there's, a, it's been a lot of ups and downs and tough times and, and good moments. And um, I, I think I'm going to answer the, a bit of, there's another question in the Q and A there around, and I, I'm thinking back to around this time last year and uh, Indy Johar said, uh, you know, that our values change. Um, and with, with this event, they almost changed overnight. Um, and our, and, and our concepts of public space and, um, and like traffic and, and like what we, Anyway, like, like those sort of values that we have and the, that sort of shapes our conversations moving forward. And that's why it's so important to, to collaborate and, and meet and talk and create art and have these conversations um, because they are, they're always evolving and, and events like these just sort of speed it up really fast. And, and that's just, anyway, that, that's, my thought. I think, yeah, the, the, the public space thing is, I, I think it, there's a lot of value in it. And you can see that in how, you know, restaurants had to spill out into public space um, and take over uh, sidewalks and, and parking spaces. And um, in some cases, it was, it wasn't the right thing to do, like it, that people actually needed more public space. Um, but in some cases, having that amenity created street life and, and and saved those businesses and, and saved jobs and employment. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's fascinating, fascinating times. I think everybody's just sort of absorbing uh, or drinking from a fire hose right now. And, I, and, and uh, it's, but, and, and I also think there's a lot of momentum that, that pe people have been uh, sort of thinking about absorbing and thinking and I think there's going to be a lot there's going to be a big push soon uh, to do a lot of things uh, when when we're able to do them so and it, it's going to be really exciting to watch and I'm looking at a couple of the questions that have popped up as well um, and one of them it, what's will be the biggest opportunity for art to re-engage people to each other after the pandemic um, and I think that's huge. I mean, art is probably it's used in therapy all the time, whether it's through making or talking, performing. It's there's, I mean, this is where having lived in, worked in the Southwest with communities that there is no separate word for art. It is just part of your life. Um, so I don't think it, I don't consider it as separate maybe. Um, so I think um, I've certainly seen it with myself that there's more creativity as we move past this. And I think that automatically generates more and more art and that connection with people. I've been chatting with friends who we'd normally get together and have make nights of some sort. Um, and I think that that is part of just working through the trauma, um, busy hands and, and chatting. So, but Barbara, what do you think as well? I feel like We've seen what they've been doing during the pandemic, and I feel like this is how we both document it and move beyond it. <laughs> uh, I think maybe the for me the key concept is the is the theme of this conference and the idea of connection and um, this potential that I think people recognize of uh, art and culture being able to connect people to each other, but also to connect people, you know, to themselves and to their own subjectivity, their own fears and aspirations, uh, and also to communities. And um, so what I'm hoping is that there are going to be increasing efforts to provide 
not just the things of art, you know, the ability to make things or to put them in uh, spaces where people can see them, but to create opportunities where there's interaction and communication and exchange um, around the ideas and the, the sentiments that are embodied in the art. So I don't know, maybe it'll be, you know, more uh, festivals and um, events like that that are very public and where people can be involved in a lot of different ways. They can be in real life, they can be online, they can uh, participate in a lot of different ways. But I, I think the, the, that's something that could be really positive and um, I hope they're, they're, that we'll see a lot of that. Great, thank you. Um, all right, with that, I think we're gonna wrap up. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the four of you for, uh, on behalf of Dalhousie, once again, um, for presenting here today. And um, now I'll pass it over to Courtney Cowell uh, for the um, performance panel. Awesome, thanks, Jacob. All right, so I can see we have Matt, Andrew, and Dave here. So we will get started now. So I'd first like to thank everyone for sticking around from the last 